Um, I'm quite exhausted, I must admit, that after eight hours, I've learned a lot. You all do amazing science, amazing people, amazing techniques. Um, although there's one thing that I must say, I'm a clinician by training, I was a bit bothered at a certain point. I thought, well, this is all for the patients at the end of the day, right? And so if I think about the patient population you want to prevent and cure and so forth, about 50% of them are XX and about 50% of XY. And apart from a really minor mention in the beginning, somehow this hasn't popped up anywhere in all the presentations. Nowhere. Which is on the one side great for me because otherwise I shouldn't be here. Uh, on the other hand, I hope that in the next 10 minutes I might convince you of why it would be worthwhile starting to look into this from the beginning and maybe also in your further work. So rather than telling you a lot about the details of what I do right now, this is going to be more of an evangelizing talk. So let's start with definitions. And as I wrote in my abstract, I'm only going to focus on that afterwards, but let's just get the definitions straight. So we talk about sex differences and we talk about gender differences. And unfortunately, in medicine, there's still people who think you can't say sex. Because if you say sex differences, you mean the act, and that's not possible. So you say gender. So you talk about differences in cells and talk about gender differences, or in mice, and you talk about gender differences. Well, that's two different things. So what you talk about, if you do, in cells is sex differences. Because what you're talking about is the XX or the XY, or a small population of patients who might be X0 or XXY. And that's the biological factors, right? So the genetics, hormones, and so forth. When we talk about gender, we mean something completely different. And we basically talk about four things. So the first thing is identity. So the identity and the biology don't necessarily have to correlate. So you can be XX, and in most cases you will identify as female, but you might also identify as male, or you might identify as none of the two. And the important aspect of this is only you know what your identity is. Nobody can tell you. Only you, within yourself, are the expert of your gender identity. When it comes to the role, everything around you starts getting into play. So what do people expect of you? How am I supposed to behave as a woman, as a man? How do I express disease, pain? When do I go to the doctor? How do I do that within my culture and according to my gender? Relationships is anything from professional to personal. So how do you communicate at work? How do we talk to our patients? How do you communicate with your team? How do you negotiate things at work in terms of income, at home, in terms of who takes care of relatives, children? How do you negotiate that as a couple? And then there's institutional gender, and you see that I live in a somewhat delusional world, at least if you think about Germany. So this is what institutions expect you to be, or how you're supposed to conform to your institution. So what does a CEO in our eyes look like? So that what it looks like in my eyes, it doesn't really confirm here in Germany at least. What does a professor look like? What are you expected to be in that institution? So all of that makes up gender. I'm not going to go more in detail of this, but keep in mind that this defines everything that goes on in this room. What goes on in your home, how you talk to your team, how you, which kind of science you're doing, who's going to do the work in the lab, who's going to write the paper, which positions are going to be in the paper, who's going to present it at the conference, and who's going to get the award at the end. All of that is somewhat related to gender. So it does matter, although today we don't have the time to do it. If there's one message that I would hope you would carry home from today, it's that every cell has a sex. So it's the one thing, even the ones you take out, and you take a single cell and do whatever you fantastically do with that single cell, that single cell has an XX or an XY chromosome acid and has been probably swimming in a broth of hormones until you took it out of the patient. So it is not neutral and we should take that into consideration. Why? Years ago, we thought that the X and the Y chromosome were only relevant for secondary sexual characteristics. We thought they were important for us to become phenotypically female or male. 
And then the last 10, 15 years, it became more and more relevant, and I'm not going to go into details here, that the X chromosome and the Y chromosome have roles that go way beyond synchronary sexual characteristics. So the X chromosome is probably one of the best investigated uh, chromosomes now for immunology because some really important genes that regulate FOXP3 and some uh, TL-like receptors and uh, interleukin receptors, they're all on the X chromosome. I mean, it has been investigated because women tend to have more autoimmune disease than men, and of course there might be a correlation, although until today we don't know exactly why. The Y chromosome might be related to cardiovascular disease in men or to the progression of autoimmune disease in men. So men don't get as much autoimmune diseases as women, but if they do, their progression is much more aggressive, much faster, and we don't know why. But it seems that the Y chromosome might play a role in that. The second point, if we talk about biology, is hormones. So this is the average female hormonal cycle. So if you take cells from any woman that is premenopausal, she will have a shorter or a longer cycle that changes every month. This happens every month. And why is that relevant? Because these changes in hormones associate with changes in cells and also in production of cytokines and, for example, in Treg numbers. Of course, it makes sense. Every cycle, every ovulation could lead to a pregnancy. And of course, the body is primed to not reject this potential product of conception, so that makes sense to have more Tregs that are active. However, since the cycle lasts 28 days, depending on when you're going to take cells, it might be a completely different setup. They might be more primed in a Th1 direction rather than a Th2 direction. So unless you know that, and you control for that, or you at least check for it, you might miss out on something really important. To quiet the people who might be scared that this is relevant for mice and rats as well, there is consensus at this moment in time that since the cycle of mice and rats is only about four to five days, these shifts are so fast that don't, you don't see a change in transcriptional profiles. So the changes we do see in the cells at the human level, we don't seem to be seeing in mouse and rats. So you can use those without checking unless it's something you want to investigate. Does it matter for disease? Well, yes. It's not just the cells. These cells do something to the body. So if we look, for example, in younger women, when, is asthma, when are they most likely to present in the ER with an asthma attack? Or when are they most likely to have decompensated diabetes? Right before menstruation. Same goes for arrhythmia, same goes for a series of mental conditions, and same goes for most autoimmune diseases. So these changes in cells also affect clinical presentation. What happens if you don't look into these things? So I'm here to bring out the scary parts. What might happen if you don't look into this? So this is a paper that came out of Jeff Mogul's lab in Canada. They studied pain about four years ago, five years ago by now. And basically what they do is um, they investigate how mice, they work mostly in mice, how mice respond to pain and how painkillers work. So the point here is we generally assume that if we work with mice, we can control things, right? We can control what they eat, we can control how they're housed, how many of them are there, how much light, how much darkness, temperature, anything. So we assume that the conditions are inbred and it's much easier to check everything. Well, unfortunately, to make the story short, who does the experiment seem to have an impact on how the mouse behaves. So, depending on whether the investigator is male or female, the male mouse, female mouse doesn't care, the male mouse shows pain at a different level. So what's happening here in short terms is the mouse smells the male pheromones, and there is a cross-species reaction. So the same behavior it would have, the same aggression in a way, or adrenaline surge it would have with another male mouse is present with the investigator, which is a bit scary if you consider it, because we don't really record who's handling the mice. We don't really record how the mice are reacting. And this is something completely new because it transcends species. We knew how they would react to another male mouse. We didn't think it would be for humans as well. And this has been confirmed by other labs as well, mostly in the field of pain. So if we don't report this, at least, we reduce reproducibility. The second one, this is clinical. 
So for pretty much every disease, there's a delay in the sex that hasn't been uh, epi epi, um, epidemiologically more represented. So if we assume that a disease is male, women tend to be diagnosed later. If we assume that a disease is female, males tend to be diagnosed later. So that applies to anything, the most famous thing is the heart attack, but for example, for bladder cancer, in many cases, diagnosis is delayed because we think that women presenting with blood and urine do have a urinary tract infection. And in many cases, they will. However, if we miss out on this, there will be delayed diagnosis. Women are reported, are report asthmatic symptoms, but slightly different than boys, so they're diagnosed later. Men, on the other hand, are not diagnosed with osteoporosis. Ask your grandfather or dad, in this case, if he's ever been screened for osteoporosis. In our opinion, in our mind, in our clinical mind, osteoporosis is a disease of postmenopausal women. So pretty much every postmenopausal woman gets screened, bone density, and in case she gets supplements. Males are not, and yet 30 to 40% of 70-year-olds do have osteoporosis. Same goes for autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases are rarer in men. But as I said before, if they have the disease, they do worse. And still, they're also diagnosed later, so they have a double effect. The last one, which I find quite interesting, is a study from Israel. Multiple sclerosis is a notoriously difficult disease to diagnose. And so patients usually see a lot of doctors before they get diagnosed eventually. But if you look at which kind of physicians the patients have seen, women most likely have met a psychiatrist at a certain time along the way. Male, most likely, an orthopedic surgeon. So we also have biases about what we think. So the second point is, if we don't think about it, we might have delayed diagnosis, or we do know that we have delayed diagnosis. Let's go to number three. This is not strictly uh, just medicine. This is algorithm bias. So this is the work by Joy Bulamwini at MIT who did her PhD work on this because one day she was working with facial recognition software. She is a woman of color. And the program didn't recognize her face. It didn't even misgender her. It didn't even say she was a man. It simply didn't see her. Then she put on a white mask, like the uh, anonymous masks, and she was recognized. So she did her PhD on checking how these commonly used, commercially available facial recognition algorithms perform with men, with women, with people with pale and with dark skin. So to check this, this is a setup of members of parliament in different countries all over the world, and they use it with the algorithms. So the good news is if you're a white man, you do fine. The bad news is if you're a woman of color, forget about it. And somewhere in between lie women with a lighter complexion and men with darker complexion. So here, this is the times you are either wrongly classified, so women being classified as men or men as women, or the algorithm doesn't recognize you at all. So in general, the white males do fine. Uh, the dark males, well, here not so much, here okay, even better than women. Here it's about the same. So what does that say? Well. The data, or the recognition, is only as good as what we feed the algorithm, right? So the question is, who designed the algorithm, and what did they feed them in the beginning? It's not the algorithm that's wrong, it's what we train it on. And that's the issue at every level, because the data is only as good as we collect it. And the data we collect, many times, might be biased. So our bias reflects in there as well. The last point, is, well, to put it in very simple terms, if you don't look for sex differences in the development of drugs, people die. And this is very clearly shown here. These are 10 drugs that have been pulled from the market in the United States between uh, 97 and 2000. In all cases, women had more side effects than men. And in most cases, women died. Why? Because sex differences were not investigated at the cellular level, they were not investigated at the preclinical level in animals, and they were not investigated in clinical trials in females. We simply didn't look. Then we used those drugs for everyone, for both halves of the population, and women started having side effects that could have been predictable. 
So my last slide. This is basically my steps towards mitigation. So the minimal things you should be doing to avoid disaster. And if you look at this and how simple this is, you get an impression of the abyss I have to look into every time I'm asked to review from my perspective, to review papers and grants. So this is why it's so simple. The first one is know thyself. I shouldn't even put it there. But how many times have I asked, are the cells female and male that you're using? And I got panicky stares and no answer. So it should be good to know. In any case, but you're good to know. Of course, nobody in this room is culpable of this, but still. Include both sexes. Well, this should make, be relatively clear at this point. But don't just include them. Please disaggregate the data. And if you do the analysis, do it stratified by sex. Don't just tell me, oh, we're great. We included 30% female in the trial. And then when I look at the results, everything is lumped up. Please do disaggregated analysis. And please report them. Because your single study will not be enough to draw essential conclusions. But we might do meta-analysis. And to do that, we need all data. Somewhere along the way, ideally in the beginning, ask an expert. Because I told you all you are experts on your gender identity. But that doesn't make you expert on sex and gender sensitive analysis. It's not enough. So somewhere along the way, you don't have to ask me. There's a lot of other people out there who start doing this. Ask somebody how to do it. And last, spread the word. And by that, I mean don't go out there campaigning. But if you review papers, if you design your next research, if you write a grant, if you review a grant, start thinking about it. Start asking about it. Because it's relevant, and as I showed you, we have a 50-50 population, XX and XY. And if we want to cure all of them and treat all of them, we might as well start looking into this in the beginning. And with this, I'm done. Thank you. I went over. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know whether there are any questions or remarks. Yes. Uh, so I have a question regarding the uh, delayed uh, diagnostics mm -hmm. that you were referring to. So, so how uh, big is the effect size? So, so you said, you know, it's later, it's this, yeah. that, so, but, but what really is Well, it? it's, ve it's very different depending on which diseases you look into. So for example, there has just been a study out of Denmark where they analyzed 170 diseases and in all of these they found delays. However, it's quite clearly quantified in cardiovascular disease where we had delays from hours, now we're at minutes. But still, from the time from the event to when they actually get treated, and in cardiovascular disease is crucial, we went from hours now to minutes in many cases, but still, there's a delay that can be anywhere between hours and minutes, depending on where you are. So in tertiary referral centers, it's pretty low now. In rural areas, it's still very high. When it comes to diseases that are chronically progressive, for Parkinson's, this might be one or two years. For uh, other diseases, let's say, well, osteoporosis in men, in many cases, it's diagnosed when grandpa breaks his leg. So we only found out the moment he's in the hospital and he gets treated, and we're like, oh, this is going to take much longer to heal because the bone structure is simply not what we want it to be. So it's very different depending on, on which disease we're looking for. <laughs>